from the book of Psalms, I said earlier that I had two assignments and I wanted in both talks that I'm assigned to address a slice of those very large subjects and to do that by an exposition of God's Word. I want to do that again as we discuss creation of man and the nature and dignity of man. Let me pray first and then we'll hear the reading of God's Word. Father, we do thank you again for the privilege of worshiping you around your Word. We ask that you would help us to lay aside all filthiness and rampant wickedness, that we may receive with gentleness the implanted Word that is able to save our souls, and then help us to be doers of the Word and not hearers only. I pray for physical strength and spiritual energy to speak your Word with faithfulness, clarity, authority, passion, wisdom, humility, and freedom. And we pray that as the seed of the Word is planted and watered, you would make it grow to your glory. Amen. Psalm 8. <clears throat> to the choir master, according to the Giddeth, a Psalm of David. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babies and infants, you have established strength because of your foes to steal the enemy and the avenger. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you care for him? You, yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. You have given him dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the sea. O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Amen. <clears throat> psalm 8 is the first song of praise in the Psalter. Psalms 1 and 2, which read like wisdom literature, are the double doors into the Psalms. Psalms 3 through 7 are filled with lament as David cries out to the Lord for deliverance from his troubles. This sense of complaint resumes in Psalm 9 and the following Psalms. But Psalm 8 is total praise. From start to finish, this Psalm celebrates the majesty of God. The heading of the Psalm, the ascription, the title of the psalm above, verse 1, reads to the choir master, according to the Giddeth, the psalm of David. David wrote this psalm of praise. Giddeth may be the musical tune it was to be sung to, we are not sure. It is addressed to the choir master to be used in corporate worship. Here is the standard of what a hymn of praise should be. No wonder contemporary worship songs lift lines from this song. Yet too many of them fall short of the depth, beauty, and eloquence of this song. C.S. Lewis rightly calls it a short, exquisite lyric. Psalm 8 is simply a celebration of the majesty of God. God's majesty is seen here through the lens of creation. In fact, Psalm 8 is the first of five so-called nature psalms, which include Psalms 19, 29, 104, and 148. 
In verse 3 of this psalm, God's majesty is put on display in the creation of the moon and stars. In verses 6 through 8, God's majesty is put on display in the creation of the birds of the air and the animals of the earth and the fish under the waters. Psalm 8 does not limit the majesty of God to what you can see through a telescope. God's majesty can also be seen when you look in a mirror. Psalm 8 is not just about the majesty of God. It is also about the dignity of man. But this psalm is no poetic selfie. The dignity of man is presented here as further evidence of the majesty of God. This is the message of Psalm 8. All of creation is a call to worship the greatness and goodness of God. Verse 4 asks, what is man? This question has baffled the greatest scientists, philosophers, and theologians. But the simple truth is that you cannot answer the question, what is man, until you answer the question, who is God? And to know God is to worship his majesty. We celebrate the majesty of God because God is great and God is good. I'm a little embarrassed. This is a theology conference and I want to walk you through Psalm 8, but those are the headings and I stole them from one of the prayers I learned to pray at dinner as a child. God is great. God is good. Let us thank him for this food. But that truly is the message of Psalm 8. God is great and God is good. Consider both truths with me in Psalm 8. First, God is great. Psalm 8 begins and ends with a shout of praise and adoration to God. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all of the earth. This doxology is more detailed in the opening of the psalm than at the conclusion. Verses 1 and 2 declare the praise of God's greatness and the paradox of God's greatness. First, we see the praise of God's greatness. That's verse 1 that declares that God is great on the earth and in the heavens. God is great on the earth. Verse 1 says, O Lord, our Lord, How majestic is your name in all the earth. In Scripture, one's name is more than a means of identification. It reveals a person's ways or nature or character. So it is with God. Exodus 20, verse 7 commands, You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. For the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. David here seeks to obey this divine command in how he addresses God in this psalm. O Lord, our Lord. The children of Israel avoided using the personal name of God, Yahweh, the self-existent one. They called God Adonai, the sovereign one. Even that name was treated reverently. But notice, David was so consumed with the greatness of God that he used both names, O Yahweh, our Adonai. This invocation is a statement of faith. It acknowledged there is only one God, O Lord. This true and living God is the God of Israel, our Lord. But this is no tribal God whose worship is limited to a particular people group. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. 
The name of the Lord is majestic, excellent, splendorous, brilliant, and magnificent. Majesty and glory are parallel terms with subtle distinction. Glory is the greatness of God's essential nature. Majesty is the open display of God's nature. The open display of God's glory revealed in His name is so great that it cannot be limited or localized. God's name is majestic in all the earth. Psalm 100, verses 1 and 2. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. God is great on the earth, but then God is great in the heavens. Verse 1 ends, you have set your glory above the heavens. Glory is not merely an attribute of God. It's the sum total of all of the attributes of God. It's the, it's the light of his nature. It's the weight of his character. We ascribe glory to God, but the glory of God is inherent. God is not glorious because we praise him. God is glorious because God is God. To make sure that we don't confuse human greatness with divine glory, the Lord has set his glory above the heavens. 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 27. Solomon prayed over the temple he erected. Will God indeed dwell on the earth? Behold, heaven and the highest heaven cannot contain you how much less this house that I have built. Solomon rightly acknowledged that nothing we do is good enough to reflect the greatness of God. Some people object to joyful thanks, passionate praise, and uninhibited worship, claiming that it doesn't take all that. But nothing we offer God can be enough, much less too much, for a God whose glory is set above the heavens. James Montgomery Boyce comments here, if God has set his glory above the heavens, it is certain that nothing under the heavens can praise him adequately. God is worthy of the best we have. Psalm 145, verse 3. Great is the Lord, greatly to be praised. And his greatness is unsearchable. If he was an average God, average praise would be okay. If he was a mediocre God, mediocre praise would be acceptable. But great is the Lord. Greatly to be praised. And his greatness is unsearchable. After the praise of God's greatness in verse 1, notice the paradox of God's greatness in verse 2. Out of the mouth of babies and infants, you have established strength because of your foes to steal the enemy and the avenger. <laughs> this verse is often referenced when a little child says something insightful. But it's about more than precocious children. The verse is declaring the greatness of God as seen in the paradox between strength and weakness. And the contrast between strength and weakness is presented against the backdrop of opposition to God. Notice the fact of spiritual opposition. There is much talk about enemies in the Psalms that precede and follow Psalm 8. They show up in this psalm, but with a twist. Notice, David is concerned about God's enemies here rather than his own. Verse 2 says the Lord has foes, and they are further described as the enemy and the avenger. Read it either way you want to. 
It's a reference to Satan and demonic forces or to some human king whose armies attack the people of God on earth. But whether these foes are human or spirit beings, the strategy is the same. The enemies of God foolishly use their power, might, and strength to overthrow God, but it never works. Psalm 2, verses 1 and 2. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers of the earth take counsel together against the Lord and his anointed. Psalm 2, verse 3, saying, let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. I can't linger there. I've got a ways to go in my own psalm, but mark Psalm 2 for reading in the private chambers of your own praying ground. That's the problem with society today. Humanity is in rebellion against God and his son, Jesus Christ. Make sure you read Psalm 2, verse 4, though. He that sits in the heaven laughs. <laughs> this is what we find in verse 2 of our psalm, the failure of spiritual opposition. Out of the mouth of babies and infants, you have established strength because of your foes to steal the enemy and the avenger. God steals the enemy and the avenger, but notice how God defeats his foes. God establishes strength out of the mouth of weak, vulnerable, helpless babies and infants. The week Jesus was crucified, he cleansed the temple of the money changers and dove sellers, and the children came in singing praises. The religious leaders were indignant. Matthew 21, verse 16 says, And they said to him, Jesus, do you not hear what these are saying? And Jesus said to them, Yes, have you never read? Out of the mouth of infants and nursing babies, you have prepared praise. Quoting Psalm 8, verse 2, Jesus declared himself to be the Lord God who establishes strength out of the mouths of little children when his religious foes refuse to acknowledge him as the Messiah King. And for the record, this is how God always works. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 27 through 29. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being may boast in the presence of God. God is great. In fact, let me tighten that up theologically. God alone is great. <laughs> the rest of Psalm 8 declares that God is good. Verses 1 and 2 focus on God alone. It is not until verse 3 that we find the first and only first-person statement in the psalm. David says, I look at your heavens. Yet this personal statement is still focused on God. As David celebrates the majesty of God, his focus shifts from what is above him to what is around him. Yet he still sees the majesty of God on display. Verses 1 and 2 praise the greatness of God. Verses 3 through 8 praise the goodness of God. And the goodness of God is seen in God's care for humanity and God's creation of humanity. First, consider with me God's care for humanity. Verses 3 and 4 record one sentence. It is a question that makes a statement about God's care for humanity. The transcendence and eminence of God work together in loving concern for human beings. Verse 3, we see the transcendence of God. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and stars which you have set in place. 
for most of us, the lights of the city block out the light of the sky. We miss the general revelation in the heavens above. Psalm 19, verse 1 says, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims His handiwork. David looked up at the clear sky in the darkness of the night, and he saw God everywhere. He called the sky your heavens. It belongs to God because God created it. But notice that creating the heavens was no laborious task for God. David calls the heavens the work of your fingers. In one sense, we cannot see as well as David saw. In another sense, we can see far better than David saw. We have telescopes, satellites, space stations that enable us to see into the heavens infinitely more clearly than David, yet he was right to call it all the works of God's finger. The vast universe, says David, is divine finger painting. The moon and the stars did not find their place by a big bang. Almighty God set them in their appointed places. This is the transcendence of God at work. But then notice the eminence of God at work. Verse 4 asks the logical question the transcendence of God raises. What then is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him? The right answer to this question is nothing. God is so transcendent that the creation of the vast and mysterious universe is child's play to him. We are rebellious little creatures that exist temporarily on a puny rock in a little galaxy on the far end of the universe. We are nothing less than nothing. But the right answer is the wrong answer. The goodness of God is seen in how God treats weak creatures of the moment like me and you. Verse 4 says, hold on to your seats. It says God is mindful of us. Psalm 144, verses 3 and 4 says, O Lord, what is man that you regard him, or the son of man that you think of him? Man is like a breath. His days are like a passing shadow. We are all one breath away from death. Like a passing shadow, we are here one moment and gone the next, yet God is mindful of us. Matthew 10, verse 29 through 31, Jesus says, Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? And not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father, but even the hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore, you are more valued than many sparrows. God is mindful of us, and likewise, verse 4 says, God cares for us. Notice the progression from God in thought to God at work. God cares for the Son of Man. And the word cares is more than feelings here. It means God longs for us and seeks us out and takes care of us. As Christians, we know this better than David did. In verse 5, David uses the term Son of Man to describe human weakness. But in the Gospels, Jesus used the term to refer to himself. And in so doing, Jesus identifies himself as God who put on human flesh to visit us with his redeeming love that died on the cross and rose from the dead. God cares for humanity. But notice as well God's creation of humanity. God created man with dignity. Verse 4 says, what is man? Verse 5 answers in four words, these are the big words of the text about mankind. Listen to what David says to God about mankind in the inspired scriptures. 
you have made him. Human beings are not evolved beasts. God created us. Psalm 100, verse 3, know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. How did God make man? Verse 5 says, you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings. This statement is difficult to translate again, but easy to interpret. The Hebrew word translated heavenly beings is Elohim. It can refer to the true God or false gods or angels. The Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, refers to it as, renders it as angels. Seems the most literal reading is that God made man a little lower than God himself. The ESV plays it safe and just translates it the heavenly beings. Whatever way you translate it, the meaning is the same. God created man with a sense of divine dignity. We are not a little higher than the beast of the fields. We are a little lower than the heavenly beings. Verse 5, you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. God created humanity. God crowned humanity. What is humanity's crown? It is glory and honor. Glory and honor are both described to God in verse 1. In fact, David says, you have set your glory above the heavens. But the glory of God that is set above the heavens is also set on the earth. God has crowned humanity with glory and honor. This does not mean in any way that we are little gods. What you have here is simply an affirmation of Genesis chapter 1, verse 27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female. He created them. God created man with dignity, and God created man for dominion. The Lord did not create mankind merely to reside on earth with animals. God created man to preside over the earth. He made man have to have dominion over the earth. N note the stewardship of human dominion. Verse 6, you have given him dominion over the works of your hands, you have put all things under his feet. We, we do not have dominion by some evolutionary theory of the survival of the fittest. God gave us dominion over the works of his hand and put all things under our feet. We are stewards of the earth who are responsible and accountable to God. Likewise, think of the scope of human dominion. You have put all things under his feet. Verses 7 and 8 elaborate. All sheep and oxen, and also the beasts of the fields, the birds of the heaven, and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the path of the sea. God has given humanity dominion over all animate life, from the birds of the air to the fish of the sea to the beasts of the field. Consider the sign of human dominion. It's not in the text, it's related to the text. Psalm 8 is a beautiful song of praise, but it leaves out an important part of the story, right? Yes, God created man with dignity and for dominion, but our original design was marred by the fall. The sin of Adam and Eve introduced sin, guilt, shame, suffering, and death into the human experience. Each of us stands guilty before God as sinners who have fallen short of the glory of God. The image of God in us is tainted 
twisted, tarnished. We have iniquity. There is, there is a virus in our software that makes our hardware malfunction. And it has affected everything. Birds escape us, fish elude us, animals attack us. Rather than submitting to our dominion. But the plan of God has not failed. The first Adam plummeted humanity into sin. The second Adam brings humanity to righteousness. Just for the record, if I was at my church and said those two sentences, it would have been a lot of noise. <laughs> <laughs> Hebrews 2, verses 6 through 10. Hebrews chapter 2, verses 6 through 10. It has been testified somewhere. What is man that you are mindful of him or the son of man that you care for him? You made him for a little while lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor, putting everything in subjection under his feet. Now, in putting everything in subjection to him, he left nothing outside his control. At present, we do not see everything in subjection to him, but we see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. We are sinful people. We live in a fallen world. We are weak creatures of the moment. We are always staring death in the face. We are doomed to eternal punishment if left to our own devices. But God... God intervened by sending the Lord Jesus Christ to taste death for us. His death on the cross paid our sin debt. His resurrection from the dead gives us new life. When commentator said it well here, Christ's work on the cross did not merely undo Adam's sin and put us back where Adam was. Rather, it gives us much more. It made us like Christ. How should we respond to such an indescribable gift? Psalm 8, friends, does not explain the dignity and dominion of man to boost our self-esteem. It seeks to boost our God-esteem. This is why the psalm ends right where it begins. O oh Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth. O oh Lord, my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds thy hands have made. I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunders, that power throughout the universe displayed. When through the woods and forest glades I wonder and hear the birds sing sweetly in the trees. When I look down from lofty mountains grander and hear the brook and feel the gentle breeze. And when I think that God his son not sparing, sent him to die. I scarce can take it in. That on the cross, my burden gladly bearing, he bled and died to take away my sin. When Christ shall come, 
with shout of acclamation and take me home. What joy shall fill my heart. And I shall bow in humble adoration and there proclaim, my God, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior, God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. We praise you, Father, for your greatness. You are indeed great and greatly to be praised. From the place where the sun rises to the place where the sun goes down, your name and your name alone is worthy of our highest expressions of praise. We praise you as our creator, our sustainer, our ruler, we praise you for being our Redeemer through the finished work of your only begotten Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. We praise you that in your sovereign grace you made him to be sin who knew no sin, and we might become the righteousness of God in him. We praise you for it. We proclaim the greatness of your name, for from you and through you and to you are all things. And to you alone be glory forever. Amen.